Welcome to the podcast, The Regs, and for this episode, I brought on another guest who kindly yet firmly bullied me into letting him on here, you uh, which he asked me very politely in all Once. seriousness. Um, we just started 20, minutes, 20 ago. minutes ago, the podcast, but and it, degraded it was into so off topic, degeneracy. it was it was just us throwing it was our usual banter between me and this friend of mine where we just PG throw friendly. insults at each other and is not exactly uh, pertaining to the topics of this podcast. And may, may have violated a few international treaties, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But anyways, um, Anywho. why don't you introduce yourself? Guten Tag. I, uh, I'm his... I want to say hunting aficionado, but yeah, yeah, I'd say I've okay. I've been hunting with you more than pretty much any of my other friends, so that's a concerning thought. Um, well, I either go with you or by myself, so that just sounds depressing. But I so if I go hunting, I'm gonna find you frozen to a tree with a sign that says, "This is my gun. It killed the bar that <laughs> killed me. <laughs> this is my rifle. This is my gun." So yeah, no. This this is the stuff I was talking about Except as far so as worse. So, getting so off worse. topic, but way worse and more yeah. crimes are involved generally. Yeah. Um, Anyways, um, so I was born in Washington and it sucked big time, and then I moved up here. Why in, did it suck? It's Washington. What about Washington sucks? Well. For example, and this is like 2012 numbers, <clears throat> maybe, or 2014, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, a hunting license was $140 compared to, say, I think it's about... I think it's $30 here. 30 or 40 somewhere around there. It's uh, because roughly one-third the cost. I get the dual fishing and hunting license, like, and it's like $60. 60. Yeah, so I think it's like yeah. $40 for a hunting license and 20 for a fishing license up here. Oh, dang, that's coming up. I just realized soon yeah. we got to... Wow, yeah, that's like think, a week and a half. I was in 2020 tweet. That. And, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so basically um, any kind of hunting is three to five times more expensive like you can get registration just pick out a tag for a fully mature bull moose up here and just good luck whereas some moose tags are really any moose tags in washington are once in a lifetime draw not like once in a lifetime odds but once you get it you can't enter for that tag anymore um same thing with uh sheep goats um not a big knowledge base on elk because I only saw one herd of like 50,000 once in 12 years and that was driving along the highway when I was like 8 in eastern Washington uh, real quick just to take a quick segue why should people listen to you uh, what's your credibility on this this I is I mean I, I know you personally of course but this is more for uh, any of the, the audience who are listening know. yeah um well, this... take it as you will. Most people don't listen to me, and then I end up being right some of the time. Okay. I'm 100% right 50% of the time, <laughs> usually. No, I'm talking about, like, what's your yeah. background in um, this that gives you credibility? I have been recreationally fishing and hunting in Washington basically since I was, like, 6 till I was 12, and then I moved up here, and I have been avidly fishing and hunting uh, basically as far as I want to drive north and south in this state. So about two miles? <laughs> <laughs> From your house? <laughs> <laughs> no. That's a joke, by the way. Um, I have... Obviously, I'm limited to mostly a road system because my truck can't swim. But <laughs> Or fly. I mean, if I go fast enough, it feels like it's about to leave the ground. But <laughs> basically, anywhere between Homer, which is a four and a half to five hour drive south and just south of Fairbanks, which is about a seven hour drive north. You're based out of Anchorage. Yeah. Yeah. The one where all the people are. Or like half of the people are. Three hundred and fifty one thousand residents in Anchorage. Last I checked, I think oh, it was, was like two thousand seventy. Last I checked was like twenty eighteen. I think it's about three seventy I checked recently. That's frightening. Yeah. But to be fair Dog, the, the town that I lived in in Washington that had the elementary school, middle school, and high school campus on one field, like uh -huh. from here to the end of the parking lot, uh -huh. 
has probably more people than this entire state. And we were considered a <sighs> rural town. I believe that. Yeah, I've been fishing, hunting. Uh, He's looking at the yeah, I am. population demographics at the moment. Uh, what does it say? 288,000. That went down a lot. Oh, thank God. It must have been that one winter where it was negative 20 for a month. We're in that winter now. No, we're not, because it's not negative 20 yet. It was negative 5 yesterday. It's got to negative 20 at my house a couple times over the last few I days. I don't know. When I uh, Two years ago, it was like negative 20 for like most of a month. I don't like think that was... Like a solid negative 20. I don't think that was two years ago. I worked at the ski area, which was two years ago. I lived closer to that than you do now. And for the record, uh, I remember it sp- quite vividly, actually, because... It was my sophomore year of high school, and that was about... I find that funny because we're the, you're older than I am, and I was in my senior year when that happened, so it's that just was another cold four year, years I ago that you're talking about. Yeah. That would Actually, that... no, it's about five years now. I'm talking about two years ago. I don't remember then, but... The, the ski area closed down the... because someone got frostbite on the lift. The point is... It I've been up here too cold. I've been fishing and hunting up here for a while, as in almost half of my living years. And <clears throat> I'm sometimes good at it when things cooperate and start a line. So yeah. As anyone else could say. Yeah, but I got spots and <laughs> tales to tell. Like So, anyways, uh what would you say just Aside from the people and the size of the state or low geographical location, well, Washington's doo doo for hunting and fishing. Yeah, um, overpopulated, overfished, overhunted, overregulated, overtaxed, overpriced, and it's rainy and shitty most of the time, which is great and all. Well, I mean, you could argue the same rainy and shittiness for here too. Yeah, you could, but at least where we live, there's four seasons. That's true, Washington. Is it's hot or two cold? Two and a half. No, <laughs> two it's, and a half. It's not. No, where I used to live was coastal Washington, like okay. all the way left and all the way up. I lived like two miles from the Canadian border. So here's how it goes. Let's just start um, March. So it's rain, and then you get to June and July, and then it's warm rain. You get like three weeks of like ninety degree heat, mm-hmm. and then everything smells like dead fish because I lived a mile from a beach, mm-hmm. which was just. Ugh. It had, like, foot-thick seaweed beds for, like, 50 yards on so each part of So it smelled like low tide. It smelled like low tide in a microwave. Okay. Like someone microwaving tuna in the work it, microwave. It smelled like terrible yes. microwave. It tide. smelled like dead fish and seaweed. Which so, is funny. On a side note, which is why I always find um, Febreze, like how it's called, like, ocean spray, like air freshener I'm using. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah. that doesn't smell like death. <laughs> no, it Which is what not. it is. Yeah. Ocean spray is not a good smell. No. It's it at best salt. Like weird dank salt, salt. Salt salty air. The only good air on an ocean is not near land. Is not near land, no. But no. um yeah, you had like um two months at most where it was like ninety degrees and then it went back to warm rain, got to cold rain, you had roughly two to four weeks of soggy, disgusting wet snow that lasted for about another week and then it just went back to wet. So you just had rain. That was the season in Washington. Hot or cold, rain. Great. As well as the fact that, like, the only decent thing to hunt there without going out of your way monetarily or physically is deer. And a large mule deer is, like, the size of an average caribou up here. And I would wager that, like, one of the larger caribou herds up here, and there's several, makes up almost the entire deer population of Washington. So, on a number side, what would you say that's that would be? Dude, I hunted in Washington when I was 12. Right, but if you had to estimate, because you know, uh, you just gave a comparison between the deer and a caribou population up here, and I know for a fact you probably have a good idea of what the caribou population you're comparing it to might be. So I'm asking for the viewer's sake and also for my edification. Okay. Um, so according to the internet, 
Washington has a combined deer population of about 305,000. And... Keeping in mind that Alaska caribou tend to meander a lot between yeah. Alaska and Canada, um, there are approximately 950,000 caribou in Alaska. Not, like, at any given time, but ones that migrate through. So, yeah... That is my mad for saying one of the larger herds because there's 32 of them, so you can't really do a direct comparison. You could divide the number of av- average. Anyways. Roughly, this state has three times more of the most po- most common hoof stock, but you also have to keep in mind that there's many times more moose here than Washington. You can actually hunt goats in some kind of number, as in it's a lifetime tag in Washington. Sheep are huntable here. They're much harder to get to than Washington because most bighorn sheep in Washington... Here's another question for you. Do you uh, suppose that there's more hunters in Washington than there are in Alaska? I wouldn't say in total. I would say per square mile or just average, like, ratio of land to hunters, there's more in Washington because it's a much smaller state. Well, of course. There's an overall higher population. But there are probably collectively more hunters here. It's just, it makes, or the state in its geography makes a lot of places hard to, in some places, impossible to get to. Yeah, of course. So a lot of places have just never been hunted before. Yep. So it keeps a lot of the um, migratory games safe because they do have these little safe zones that are like a 30-mile four-wheeler ride through swamp, which... So let me, my, my, what I'm specifically trying to ask is, do you suppose there's a comparable amount of hunters in Washington to, uh, the population of Alaska? So just over like 700,000, um, the direct number of hunters is there's probably more up here, but it seems like there's a lot less just because of how big the state is. Yeah, no, I, I get that. That's what you're saying earlier. But I'm saying like the amount of people who go hunting for whatever it is yeah. in Washington, despite there's millions of people in Washington. Yeah, like versus... a higher ratio of hunters per capita. No, I'm asking or... the actual number of people who go hunting every every year for whatever animal uh, in Washington. Do you suppose is the same number, if not more? Then there is people that live in Alaska. Oh, are you saying, like, there's probably more hunters in Washington than the entire population of Alaska? Yes, that's what I'm asking. That is a really good question, because in recent years, Washington has had a serious downgrade in outdoorsman-quality people, I would say. Yeah, I'd Mostly say that, because yep. when I was there, a lot of the people who were hunting were either the good old boys or like 30 year olds who thought sheep hunting would be fun did it once and then decided they hated it (laughs) Um, because from personal experience going on a goat hunt this fall yeah um, it's great until you have to do the work (laughs) you could say the same for any kind of hunting though oh no it's so much worse it's so so much worse it's so much more rewarding and amazing tell us about the goat hunt then I'm really curious well because I don't know really anybody actually who does any amount of goat hunting on the mainland but I know tons of people who do goat hunting on Kodiak is a little bit different because generally well it's very different yeah and, and even then just not even the terrain but just goat hunting there versus here like Kodiak yeah it's a really like right, but I'm not, not asking for a comparison. I'm just asking what your experience was here. I'm just saying it'll differ, so allow me of to course. elaborate. Yeah, it's, okay. We're 14 minutes in. we got a while. Um, Kodiak is a, overall a much smaller area, and generally if you do go goat hunting in Kodiak, you're either getting a boat, plane, or something ride to where you're going to hunt out of. It's almost never a boat. Uh, I'm just saying, like, if you just need to go, like, around an outlet or, like, around to a different inlet. Yeah, yeah, if, but so goats on Kodiak, uh, take it from somebody who actually knows a lot of goat hunters on Kodiak and works and lives there a lot. How dare um, you. Yeah, I'm going to pull that card. I'm, I'm not disparaging that. I'm just saying that the trek to the base of the hill or the really the starting point of the hunt is 
potentially shorter on foot on Kodiak due to the fact that it's mostly mountains. There's not a lot of flat ground from what I understand. Yep. So getting to the base of the hill where the goats are would, in my opinion, be easier um, on your body. But I would, I would, <clears throat> would not think it's a stretch of the imagination to say that getting up the hill to them is just as hard, if not worse, because of the nature of the terrain there and how steep and rocky it is. So, to give you a personal experience, me trying to get up this, it's not, it's a mountain, but it's probably no taller than 1,300 feet. So it's like it's, flat top, but it's all straight up. No, actually, it was like a perfect pyramid. But what I was going to say was that trying to get up this mountain, the brush, grass, oh, yeah. pushki, salmonberry bushes were all like a good three feet higher than I was and uh, I'm about six foot three so and it it was yeah I never made it up that mountain for those of you who don't know what he called pushki and the cow parsnips devil's club cow parsnips pushki devil's club all the same thing they're not the same thing pushki is a different species than the devil's club they all hurt and they all they, suck. That is true, though. That <clears throat> is, yes. So basically, for those of you who don't know or are uninitiated, it's a plant that has these woody, like it. They almost look like celery and smell like weed and can get <laughs> like. <laughs> it can be anywhere between four and seven feet tall, and yeah. they have these. The, the stalks are a lot harder than celery. They're almost wood like, but they're covered in spines like a fucking. The I, Devil's Club, yeah. They're called Devil's Club, yeah, for a reason. And I... I P- Pushki... I, I doubt that yeah. I can stress this enough, but it's basically a three-quarter inch r- around stalk covered in these spines that range in anywhere from a quarter to one inch long. And the best part is they're so flexible, they don't snap. So when you step on one and then go to move and it whacks you in the crotch, it's... It's a wonderful experience, and wherever you go bear hunting, wherever you go moose hunting, wherever you go sheep hunting, wherever you go goat hunting, they're everywhere. You know, those animals actually like to eat Yeah, they do, the... which is why I, I hate it so much, because it's like bears, they eat fresh devil's club, because it's, it's actually really sweet. Yeah. I've never eaten it. It just smells less like garbage than full-grown uh, devil's club. And devil's club gets through your clothes, too. The spines oh. on it are so fine. That they could, they easily get through. Yeah, they just break off, and then like and eight, then, eight, 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 or eight hours later, you're like, "Ow, what's they, stabbing me?" They irritate you too. Yeah, they have venom in them. Yeah, or some kind of secretion. But the, uh, the leaves are the worst part too, because the leaf is like totally smooth on the top, like just this oh, big yeah. poison ivy looking yeah. leaf, and then the bottom of it, all those little spines, they're everywhere. Yeah, I forgot so, like, about the leaves. You'll fall, and you'll just see the leaf, and you'll be like. Oh, great, because we have a, a species of plant up here that looks almost identical, minus the spines. Pushki. Mm, that might be the celery-looking well, shit, like it's really okay. easy to break. So let me tell you about a little bit about celery. Not celery. <laughs> yeah, the four-foot-tall <laughs> celery that we have. Because <laughs> yes. uh, it's like plenty of chance of Pushki. Pushki can get really tall, just as tall as Devil Club, Devil's Club, if not taller. They are um, toxic too. They'll cause serious rashes that will eventually scar over, and they'll cause blisters. Oh, we're talking too. about a different plant. And then, um, oh yeah, stinging nettles. No, that's another species altogether from uh, Pushki or cow parsnips. Is yeah, no, I, I've I've run through those and had like no ill effects. Yeah, some people are they have effects on some people they don't. For but those lower forty-eight people who may or may not be listening to my unfiltered garbage um what he's explaining is pushki is basically like devil's club on or it's not devil's club um it's devil's club without no, the spines it's, looks very similar to just giant celery mm, and uh has an emerald green mm, coloration quit let me speak to no i'm trying to think of the word because my brain's having an aneurysm um, what are you talking about oh and it also smells like mar- it has a very similar Mara-Jolana. smell yeah. To marijuana, and it's pungent, too. I don't know <clears throat> what's the... what about it, but... Stinging, yeah, so for the lower 48 people who live literally anywhere, it's like stinging nettles, but like four times as tall and the thickness of a broom handle. Um, yeah, and uh, that's a good... It's a 50-50 chance if it makes you feel like your skin's on fire. And giant 
like leaves on it too. Yeah, which is funny because whenever I go to eat shit when I'm hunting, and I'm like, oh, I'll grab that. Ninety percent of the time, I'm oh. grabbing Devil's Club, and it just stabs the shit on my Wait, hand. I got a quick story to tell you. Oh, this is a boy. true story that my coworker uh, at the hat one of the hatcheries I work at told me. When she used to live in the village, she would sell pushki, and we're doing this podcast in my, my friend's truck. truck. And it's eight degrees it, outside. It's getting colder, but. Uh, she would take Pushki, dry it out, and sell it to the cannery workers that would come to work in the would summer they smoke that shit? as weed, and oh, they would Jesus. come back for more. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> they were probably getting high just the wrong kind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, Jesus. Exactly. That's, that's wrong. It, like... Now, I think... Like, I appreciate the privateering, but damn, you probably <laughs> gave somebody a really bad trip. <laughs> yeah, some... <laughs> Like, yeah, this is weed. Why is there, like... Why is it, like, all stem? Uh, why am I blacking out time. every time I yeah. Why did I meet it? Elton John? <laughs> um, anyway. Um, yeah, so my goat hunting experience... We we went back. It's, like, a 12-mile trail on four-wheeler to this valley. And... Um, Quick question. What mountain range were you hunting in? Was it just these ones right here? Chugiak yeah. Mountain Range? Yeah, okay. it was Chugiak State Park, which um, has some pretty gnarly shit. But the um, a, the planned schedule was about a week. So most goat hunting trips, you get to wherever your vehicles can stop, and then you hike several miles through the woods, a trail, whatever. Question, who did you go hunting with? My dad. Okay. Um... <clears throat> It's usually a several mile trek to get to the base of whatever hill you intend on hunting. And thankfully, we spotted a goat like a mile in. Because this whole valley, it's a really narrow but pretty long valley. So we were just walking through the whole thing. And we find this goat that's like 13, 1400 yards up this cliff. Well, not cliff, but it's a slide zone, which gets progressively steeper. And this is our first day of what's supposed to be a six or seven day trip. And we're just having this like, oh, should we? Should we not? Should we? And we're like, hey, I mean, why not? It's here. The only other goats that we've seen are on basically impassable areas. And that's the wonderful thing about goat hunting is that provided there's no sheep around, which have golf ball sized eyeballs, which makes them extraordinarily paranoid about anything that isn't them. Goats really don't care. Like, you, if you don't act weird, you can get within 50 yards of goats, and they usually don't care. Because nothing really lives up near them except sheep, and they live even higher than that. So, we decide to go up the hill, and for probably the first... It felt like miles, but it was really only like 700 yards... And to be fair, vertical distance and horizontal distance, we moved vertically more than we moved horizontally. It was a pretty steep slope, but it was Devil's Club. It was alders, which are these annoying trees that grow in, like, bunches of eight. And whenever you're trying to climb uphill, they naturally point downhill. So they're horrible to go up, and it's with the packs and rifles and a bunch of stuff to, like, to snag on trees. And we're going up the hill, and we get into one of these slide zones, and that's the, the beautiful thing about hunting mountains is that from the bottom, you can see your route up, but as soon as you're in it, you're blind because there's trees everywhere, and you're, the grass and brush around you is just as tall as you are. And we get up there, and we're like, oh, well, funky. I can't see anything. So we're like, well, let's just try and pick our way through, and we end up out in this slide another three or 400 yards across hill later, and like 500 yards directly up the hill, we see that goat just chilling, vibing on a rock, not really caring, just laying down. The only bad news is there's like six or seven sheep directly underneath it, like within 50 yards, just also hanging out, eating rocks, doing whatever sheep do. And like I said, the main problem with sheep is that, like, they're weird. Like how white-tailed deer are skittish, they take that and turn it to 11. Like, if you breathe weird and you're within 400 yards of them, they'll just leave. They just run away for no reason. Because they know where they go, you can't follow. So, this whole time, we're on this nasty, slippery, shaly sl slide that's probably a 50 or 55 degree angle. It's pretty damn steep, and we're just wearing, you know, just regular hunting boots, and got our packs and our rifles, and we're like, well, hmm, 
do we continue onwards and risk making a bunch of noise with all of our gear, or do we take our packs off, put on our white painter suits, dress like the locals, and continue with our rifles? So we do that, and we're continuing to climb up this hill, and it just keeps getting progressively steeper and steeper to the point where we're basically like vert vertically scaling these little like rock terraces, and it's like, oh, well, I'm, I might die, but this is fun. And like you know, if you slipped and fell, you wouldn't stop for a while. Like it wasn't a legitimate cliff, but. On an off note, uh, one thing I was told by a avid goat hunter I work with, uh, on these forums where he talks about goat hunting with other people, there'll be occasionally these amateurs who... They're like, oh, it's fine. It's just like climbing a recreational we'll, we'll hiking hold, mountain. Hold up. They'll be asking, like, should I get climbing equipment to go hunt these goats? And everybody who's had <laughs> any experience like, with this... like, yes, but no. No, they collectively say, like... No, and the yes but no thing, by the way, is an inside joke. I'll have to explain it later. Okay. But um, if anybody's seen the movie, they'll know what it's from. But yeah, I've never seen the movie. You've never? It's it's called Pirates. It's by the same people who did Wallace and Gromit. No, I was so when I thought it was that was, that was a meme that came out after the fact. But yeah, it's a meme. It's a scene from the movie. Like it's the it's the claymation pirate, and yeah. it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, the ATF. No, I, are those things legal? And the dude wearing nods. Well, yes, but no. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm telling you this. I thought the, I thought it was funny because at the time I have, and I still do, have a lot of friends from other countries, and when they're trying to tell me something or like what a word means, and I'm like, oh, it, it's like uh, blah 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 blah, and, they, and they're they like, they can't quite explain it, but they know what you mean. And yeah, like, well, well, yeah. Yes, but no. Exactly. That's why I thought it was funny, and that's why. Yeah. It's inside no, I, joke. I agree, but it, it's. It's a movie scene. But uh, anyways, what I was going to say was people will be like, should I get climbing gear? And everybody who's had any kind of experience says no, because then if you get yourself into somewhere with the climbing gear, you might not be able to get yourself out. So from my personal experience, the m main reason that I would... Obviously, from a hunting perspective, having, like, ropes and harnesses and crampons and all that, that, that's dumb. Like, that's so loud and so bulky. To make the actual ascent easier, like, having crampons and, like, picks and walking sticks, it would make the actual ascent easier. But to be fair, you can get somewhere with that that you're never going to leave with an 80-pound pack. Right. So, un unhindered like bare person oh yeah no definitely if you want to go where goats are I would definitely bring climbing gear but if you want to leave with a goat I wouldn't just trust your knees aren't going to explode anyways but yeah with the story yeah for example um, this is a picture of where we were because you guys can obviously see pictures. I'm showing Max yeah so he can comment and put um, tr uh, affirmation to my tall tales so it's a picture of a mountain so this is the slide <laughs> this, this is the slide we were on yeah so where we spotted that goat was from down here. Uh -huh. We hiked up this slide right here, and we're the 400 and some yard mark was like right down here. And the goat was actually up here. Oh. Uh -huh. Which you can't tell, but it's steeper than hell. And this is a video of where we were at. So that gives you kind of an idea of the slope of the hill. I'm standing on a rock, which is the only reason I'm not sliding down the hill. And so. There's no snow that's obvious where you guys are at, so why were you putting on the white painter suits? So we look like sheep, because okay. they may be smart, but they're kind of dumb. <laughs> they're so their intelligence is yes, but no. Yes, they're, <laughs> they're smart, but they're dumb. Yeah. So they're smart enough to realize that movement that isn't them is bad juju, but they also aren't smart enough to realize that two humans wearing white painter suits aren't them. Yeah. So we were climbing up these little shaly outcroppings, and I'm, like, stripping the leaves off trees and shit to keep from falling off backwards. And I come up to this little, like, Omaha D-Day Beach-esque rise where it's, like, we're crouched down there, and there's just this little lump, and I can't see beyond it. And I, my dad's probably seven or eight feet behind me, scrambling on hands and knees, and I poke my head up, and all of a sudden I see eight sheep staring at me from, like, 50 yards away. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh, that's where they went. Because, like, the last hour, we couldn't see the goats. I saw one sheep off to the right in this little slide area. You could only hunt the males, correct? So, for that goat tag, it was an any goat, which is oh. why it's like a .001% chance of getting it. And they gave okay. out four tags that year. Okay. Four whole tags, which, for reference, is extraordinarily low. But goats, 
when you could just go get an any goat tag, they got over hunted because they're so easy. Not easy to get to, but they're easy to hunt, which sounds like a contradiction, but the hunting is the getting close to and successfully harvesting the getting to them. Yeah, no, none of that's easy. Okay. But I poke my head up over this little rise and it's like, oh, well, that's problematic. And I poke my head back down. I'm like, hey, so um, they're right there. He's like, where? Like 70 yards, 50, 70 yards away. He's like, oh, okay, well, let's get ready. And I poke my head back up again, get a little taller. And another 80 yards behind these six or seven sheep is the goat that we've been traipsing up this steep hill to try and find, just chill on a rock. And I'm like, oh, cool. Well, that's nice. And we get into position, and to preface this, goats have bones unlike anything I've ever hunted as far as the ratio of body weight to thickness. Like, if you've, anybody who's listening to this has ever done, like, um, soup with, like, a beef bone, cows weigh, like, 900 to 1,200 pounds. A goat, on a good day, weighs, like, 200, and the bones, I would say, are roughly the same thickness. Like, they are incredibly thick so if you ever go goat hunting and someone says bring a bear gun for bears no for the goats because they do not like to die and i will tell you this in a moment so we get into position and we're gonna shoot this goat and my dad gets to shoot first because you know he's never gone go- well he's gone goat hunting but it was in the 90s so this is kind of his last hurrah as it were and he shoots, and I was supposed to be his backup shooter, but the goat's hauling ass across this slide, so I try and shoot it and just clip the brisket, like just zing it, and it starts to have a little hernia pop out because I just opened up the gut cavity. I didn't hit any guts, just opened it up, and it starts to pop the guts out, and I'm like, oh, well, nice. I'm going to have to clean that. And then it runs around the kind of a bowl at the top of this slide right up next to the cliff face and stops behind this bush just staring right at us. I can see its silhouette, and I'm talking to my dad and I'm like hey I can see it you want me to shoot it and he's like well I mean if you can see it yeah so I shoot it and it drops again and by this time it had been shot a total of three times and it was still very much active and I shoot it and it falls off this little outcropping probably six or seven feet straight down to the slide and starts tumbling down towards us wedges itself in between a couple of trees and we're like cool yeah let's go get it And we run up to it, and it's breathing, and it's conscious, and it's still very alive, and just laying there. And we're like, huh. Well, that's interesting. And we're like, well, what do we do? Do we shoot it? And we both, I got a 270, he's got a 6mm Remington, and both of those are fairly high-velocity cartridges. So shooting this fleshy, well, you know, bloodshot meat's not great, and it doesn't taste good. And you don't want to point-blank your game animal from like three feet away with your high-powered hunting rifle because you get that shotgun versus watermelon effect. (laughs) Yeah. Not to mention, it's on rocks, so, you know, shrapnel is a thing. And we're like, well, what do we do? And we're sitting there musing about this, like checking the animal out, like trying to poke it and see, like, male or female and see how conscious and um, aware it is. And we're just sitting there and this has been going on for like 10 minutes and you know usually once you shoot something three times and it's laying there it usually starts to die pretty quick and then the goat gets up and just hauls ass right down the hill and we're like what the fuck and my dad's sitting there on his butt right next to it kind of with his rifle across his lap and as soon as it gets up he tries to shoot it from the hip and just completely misses from like three feet away and I'm like, okay, well, here's your knife. Give me the gun. I'm going to shoot it. And it's by, it's like 50 yards further down the hill by this time and making trail, which is impressive for an animal with a hernia worse than I've ever seen externally. It's got a blown-up shoulder from my shot and one of his shots. We didn't know this at the time. His first shot completely missed any of the vitals because we were shooting so steep uphill. It went over the spine and just hit meat. It hit nothing important. So by this time, other than it dragging some extra hardware along the ground, it was completely fine internally. And I grab his rifle, and I don't know how, but I crawled, scrambled, and hopped my way like 70 or 80 yards further down the hill, and I see it, and I shoot at it, I think, twice, and I break its neck with one of the shots, and it piles up into a bunch of trees. And by this time, we started going up the hill at about 10 a.m., and it was about 3 p.m. by this point. So, you know, the fun had ended and the work actually began. So we got this thing, 
and we're sitting there. We have no packs. I just have my knife. My dad dropped his in a bush and couldn't find it as we were gutting the goat. And it's like, I dropped it like a foot away from my foot. Where'd it go? And it was just gone. So we're like, oh, okay, this is cool. And ironically, um, bags of meat don't really roll faster. So we kind of just had this idea, well, like, our packs are down there in the bottom of that slide, so we could just, you know, kick it down the hill. So we pull the goat out of the trees it was wedged in and just kind of go, eh. How, how big was this goat? Um, I would probably say it weighed... Before we took the, uh, before we took the bones out when we packed it because we quartered it so the spine and the ribs we took the meat off the ribs but the spine the ribs and um yeah I mean basically that was all that was left the pelvis spine and ribs were all that was left but that probably weighed a good 20-30 pounds so I say the whole goat probably weighed 150 180 pounds alive okay we took probably about 60 pounds of guts out of it so okay. yeah probably probably a close to 200 pound goat and we're like well I'm not going to drag this shit down this 800 yards of shale, so let's just kick it down the hill. So we booted it down this hill, and it just starts flumble, flumble, flumble. <laughs> it's flopping down the hill, and it goes out of view, and I'm like, cool, I hope it ends up near our packs. The bear doesn't get it or something. Yeah, exactly, because yeah. we're in this slide, and there's a series of them, so if it makes it over the edge, it's going to be gone. Like, it's going to be in a different slide half a mile down the hill wedged between two trees and we're going to have no idea where it is and it's starting to get dark so we're like what the hell and we start going down there and we're basically like you take a step and your foot slides 8 to 10 feet through this shale and then you take another step you're basically skiing down this mountain uh, on rocks yeah like yeah. if you've ever seen like uh, people do mountain marathon or like m mountain foot races or cross country how they're like sliding down on the descent that's basically how this was and just a quick FYI, I do have to get going here soon. Okay. All right. Um, you got like four minutes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, then we start to get down to where we think our packs were, and we're starting to get nervous because it was starting to get dark. It was like 7 o'clock at night, and we're like, God damn, I hope, like, I hope it's somewhere around here. And I, the whole time down, I'd been joking, you know, it'd be funny is if it landed like on top of our packs, man. And we get down, and my dad's like, oh, is that it right there? And I hop down after him, because my knees hadn't died yet. And I get down there, and I'm like, oh, cool, this is the goat, wedged into this bush. And I'm like, nice. And it was right where it was supposed to be, and I'm like, cool, where's our packs? And then my dad makes it down, and he's 20 or 30 feet to my left, and he goes, oh, well, there's our packs. So the goat had literally flopped six or 700 yards down a mountain to within 20 feet of our where we left our packs, which was great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of up and down, and then carrying the goat down the mountain, or rather dragging a paracord was fun, because it would try to kill me sometimes. But, um, hunting up here is in entirely its own challenge, just separate from the game that you're going after and the scale of the endeavor. Like, the biggest thing you can get in Washington, to my knowledge, is a good-sized elk and there's not a lot of the opportunities, and then you can get a 1,200-pound bull moose if you try real hard in a weekend up here. So, But it, would you say you have to go farther up no. here to find your moose? No. No? <laughs> no. You can spend months of your life trying to find a big bull elk that weighs 1,200 pounds, whereas you could probably spend a couple weekends out of, like, Kinnick Flats and find a 50-inch bull moose. Hmm. Um, I haven't tried that because I don't want to carry a bull moose out of anywhere because uh, yeah. they like to die in swamps which is its own challenge Did, you had another experience with that didn't you I shot a 700 pound cow moose in 4 feet of water you know we're going to have to do a, a hunting stories because uh, it, it didn't turn out like entirely hot garbage like you expected yeah no, yeah. Well, but thanks yep. for the vote of confidence everybody no, we'll, uh, we'll bring you back for another episode for of hunting stories is what we'll call this but um Anyways, you, you should call your series the Regs and mine's the Dregs, just because it's like not as good, but no. still interesting. This is all under the series the Regs. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry that I'm not sorry. Ha. <laughs> anyways. <laughs> uh, anyways. Anywho. Um. How was packing ever, it all out though? I mean. The goat. Yeah, just walk back. Pretty. It much. wasn't entirely bad considering we had planned on camping there for like seven to eight days. We had a bunch of camping gear and yeah. then. 
the the way it ended up going is we dragged the goat down to, next to our tent and set it up real quick like at one in the morning in the middle of the rain we're like man we could try and leave but we're tired i'm falling asleep on my feet let's just sleep so we slept until like 1 p.m. the next evening. We were just so damn tired. This yeah. little two-man tent. And I had a nice sleeping bag, but the ground we were on would have made a hell of a mini golf course. It was <laughs> so bad. Yeah. And we wake up. We bone out the, the goat, as in take the quarters off, skin yep. it, all that. And then we take the goat, the meat, and the skin, the two miles or whatever it is, back to the four-wheelers, drop that stuff there, walk all the way back, pack up all of our camp, walk all the way back to the four-wheelers, pack everything back up, and then drive our four-wheelers the 12 miles back out to the truck. So we basically left in the dark again at like 8 p.m. at night. Um, So it was fantastic. It was wonderful. It was not the most horrible like there have been hunts that I've been on where I legitimately hated doing the work a lot more like dropping a 700 pound moose in the middle of a swamp but it was definitely one of the more physically challenging because like you said a lot of people who've never done it think it's going to be either way easier or way more overcomplicated than it yeah, is because right. like you can overcomplicate it but you're not going to be successful because it's still hunting you right. have to be quiet and conscious of your surroundings and be prepared but you can't go into it like over over rigged and over gunned and you can't drag your 13 pound moose rifle up this hill you have to have a rifle that's light enough but still gets the job done like a 270 you have to have light camping gear because if you're gonna haul like while my tenure at the sporting goods location was relatively short i did put my wonderful and now not so great um, employee discount to good use so basically when I was younger ironically when I was much smaller and much less physically fit I was hauling like a 45 pound pack whenever we went out hunting which is not bad but it's not good either like for a day trip or a couple of days it should be a lot lighter and I ended up getting a lighter pack lighter bag lighter sleeping pad like ultralight game bags, ultra like nice light shooting sticks. I got a Tika T3X, which is you nice... You went on the light and mobile. Uh, yeah, yeah, I basically got everything that I needed, but got the lighter version of it. So, like, I cut down a 45-pound pack. And I was carrying two tents, by the way, because mm-hmm. we had a base camp tent planned and then a mountain tent. Uh, just real quick, we you, we got to start wrapping this up. So, yeah, but no, keep going. This is wrapping second. up, yeah. but... Long story short, I had everything that I had had with a 45-pound pack plus a whole nother tent and more food, and it was a 36-pound altogether. So I shed like 10 pounds but still had the same amount plus a couple extra things. And I think my rifle is a couple pounds lighter than my 300 short mag. But, yeah, hunting up here, like I said, is an entirely different set of challenges and to some degree similar, but to different extents than almost anywhere else in the lower 48. Interesting. All right. Well, we got to end this episode, but thank you for coming on, Lucas, even though I didn't invite you. Mm -hmm. It was still a pleasure to have you on. It was a good, um, good tale. I always enjoy a good hunting tale. Uh, Some yarns. Yep, some good old yarns. Anyways, uh, thank you for listening to this episode of The Regs. We'll be uploading again soon, and I'm sure I will have Lucas on again for another episode of Hunting Stories. I occasionally fish Um, as well. He does occasionally fish as well as... Think of us... I am... You know what, never mind. I'm not even going to try to do a difference in comparing, but... uh, we're was, both really good at our own games. I was trying to games. think of a comedic version of, like, yin to yang. Yeah, pretty much. But anyways, thank you for listening. Like, share, subscribe, whatever. Uh, if you thing. think something we said was wrong uh, or Everything not factually true, please say what it was in the comments, and we will double-check, and I'll cover it in another episode because I am always about learning something new if I don't know it already or get it wrong, and I'm going to volunteer Lucas for the same thing. So thank you for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode.